Sorry about that. I was reminded several times to turn off my mute when it was my turn, and yet I forgot at the first moment. So, Sorry about that. Thanks, Lori. Um, I would like to start with a quick poll just to see where we all stand with regard to our comfort level with quantitative analysis. I imagine most of us know more than we think we do, but just to get a quick snapshot, if you could vote, I think you can all see how to do that up at the top of your screen. You'll see there's A, B, C, D, and E, and you can choose any of these, whatever, whichever of these options you think best describes your comfort level. So can we take a minute for everybody to vote? All right, I see a bunch of votes coming in. That's great. I'll be really impressed if anybody chooses Quanti Wadi. All right, how many votes do we have so far? Does it look like everyone has voted? Let's see how much have we got. All right, that's probably, I, I hope everybody's had a chance now. Mark, can you publish the results? Oh, I see you've got it right there. All right, well, so I think that's probably about what we were expecting. In other words, most of us are in the same boat. We know the basics, but we feel like we can always use some refreshing. So what I want to talk about is how you can get your quantitative data to tell you their story. We've all experienced that moment when you sit down, you've got your survey data, your questionnaire data, your transcript data. You feel very satisfied at having been able to pull all this stuff together because it can be a real challenge. And then you say, so what is this going to tell me exactly? There is a story contained within these data, and quantitative analysis techniques can help you draw it out. Now, most of the tools that you'd need for an ATE evaluation will fall under the heading of descriptive statistics. These are sometimes dismissed as being only low level or baby statistics. And many of us have probably had clients ask us why we're not using higher level inferential statistics tools or whether we're going to be able to get statistically significant results. Most ATE projects, though, don't have to worry about this because we're almost always looking at the entire population of interest. They don't have the fundamental problem that statistics spends most of its time wrestling with the question of whether it's possible to infer from your sample to a larger population. We have no sample, so we don't have to infer, so we don't need inferential statistics. And when used thoughtfully, creatively, and specifically with reference to the evaluation questions that you're investigating, descriptive statistics are a powerful, rigorous tool in the tool that will be most appropriate to the majority of APE project evaluations. Now, there will be times when for whatever reason, your population gets big enough that you do want to sample, and your handout that you're going to get after this webinar contains some references that will help you figure out when that is, and if so, what to do about it. But before using any of these tools, your first step upon confronting that big pile of data is going to be some housekeeping. That is, you've got to clean up your data set, find errors, and missing data. Now, of course, there are as many potential errors as there are survey respondents, but errors in data tend to fall into three main categories, values that seem very unlikely given the question or other responses, outliers that are way outside the range, and contradictory responses or responses that contradict each other. Now, lots of values could seem strange, but some are strange enough to draw suspicion of an error. This example, which suggested that a firm would grow by 1,400% in one year, was drawn from an actual survey and was the result of a wandering zero. It got into a data inputting mistake and was corrected by reexamining the original survey. Another thing that arouses suspicion is extreme outliers. Now, some outliers are just that, of course, values at one far end or the other of your data set's range. But some are so extreme that they should set off the error warning bell. 150 credits would be an awful lot to earn in one semester. But probably my favorite and the most fun kind of error is the error, error of internal contradiction. This often takes the form of reversing the scale of responses, giving you something like this. 
the open-ended responses are extremely positive, and the Likert scale responses are negative. Clearly, this respondent thought that one was like first place and must be the most positive response. Now, of course, when errors are that clear, you would want to correct the data. Can you do that? There really aren't any specific standards in the evaluation or survey data analysis communities for how or under what circumstances you're allowed to alter data in the direction of accuracy. The analyst has to use his or her best judgment. In general, you correct the error if the respondent's intent is clear and if you can see how the error happened. And absolutely critically, note what you have done in the presentation of the data and spell out how and why you corrected it. If you can't be sure of the respondent's intent, then you have to call it missing data, which is its own can of worms. As with error correction, there's no set standard for how many missing items is too many, partly because it's discussed almost entirely in terms of the effect on statistical significance, which again is not what we're talking about. But it is useful to know that analysts tend to agree that if your missing data constitute less than 5% of your data, then you really don't need to worry about it. They also agree, however, that the number one thing to determine about missing data is if there's a pattern to what's missing. There could be process patterns, such as your survey is too long and everyone flags before the end, or certain questions aren't well understood and so they're skipped. Where this is the case, you may need to eliminate some items if there's a significant amount of data missing from them, or if the missing data makes you realize that the item itself may be problematic and you probably can't trust any of that data. But again, there's no standard telling you what's a significant amount of data missing, so you consider that it's significant if it seems like it might be skewing your data. That means you have to ask, is there a content pattern? There's a clear pattern in this example. Uh, here you can see that men were much more likely to refuse to answer this question or to skip the question. That means that you can't assume that the data you do have are representative of those you don't. And you have to assume that there may be other things that you don't know about those who chose not to answer. But depending on your evaluation questions, this doesn't have to be a fatal flaw. It could rather be part of your relevant findings from this survey. So you wouldn't try to close the gap and make up for the missing data. You display and report them. And that's critical in any case, whether you find a pattern or not. Now, once you've determined how much of your data are missing, there are a variety of methods for coping with missing data, all of them very intricate and beset with many conditions under which you can use them. And your handout contains some references for uh, helpful documents and websites that explain them and help you decide when you can use each one. They fall into three basic categories. First, ignoring the missing data and just changing your denominator, which you can obviously only do if you're certain the data are missing completely at random, which these references and websites will help you figure out as well. Uh, deleting some or all of the responses related to the missing data, or coming up with some kind of estimation of the missing values. The most important thing, though, is that whatever you choose to do, you explain it clearly and defend your choice. We've probably all seen data presented like the example at the top with a teeny tiny note to the bottom of the effect that then a miracle occurred or then I dreamed all this up. Of all the things that you could do that may compromise the integrity and acceptability of your data, making them opaque so that the reader does not know how much credence to give them is probably one of the most damaging and one of the easiest to stumble into. It's a very dangerous combination. Even if it makes for a busy table, uh, full disclosure is always best, and you can always offload some of the explanation into an appendix. All right, so you've fixed any errors you can, you've treated the rest as missing data, and you've dealt with any missing data as best you can. You've gone from an enormous messy pile of data to an enormous neat pile of data. Now you have to ask yourself, what kind of data am I looking at here? Quantitative data comes in two flavors. First, there's continuous data. This is any type of data that's inherently numeric in nature. It's not just represented by a number, it is a number. Examples include height, weight, test scores, grades, number of years in the workforce, and so on. Now with categorical data, you're talking about data that can be represented by numbers, but aren't in themselves numbers, such as gender, city of origin, or as in you see right here, uh, flavor of ice cream. Continuous data um, are represented here by a number line in order to underscore one of the most important distinctions between continuous and categorical data. Continuous data can be measured along a number line. As you 
see here, um, on which the distance between values is consistent. So in this example, the difference between 8 donuts and 10 donuts is the same as the difference between 10 and 12. The difference between 6 and 12 pints of ice cream is the same as the difference between 12 and 18. It could probably also be measured in points on your cholesterol score, inches on your waistline, but those aren't as much fun, so we're not representing them here. This table also shows how continuous data could sometimes be treated as categorical data. As you can see in the, uh, the columns on the, uh, the two leftmost columns, age is a continuous variable, but here it's been separated to cat into categories and therefore treated as a categorical variable. So with continuous data, you'd use all the standard analytical tools that you generally think of with descriptive statistics. Measures of central tendency, such as mean, median, mode, and measures of spread or variability, such as standard deviation, variance, and range. These are pretty standard, so other than saying that the handout points you to some good guides on using these tools and interpreting and visually representing them, we're not going to spend much time on them here particularly because much of the data that you'll work with in an ATE project evaluation will fall into the second category of categorical data. A lot of survey data is categorical. Any question that asks respondents to check off a checkbox, rank options, or choose a point on a Likert scale will produce categorical data. So let's take a look at how you would deal with data from each type of question, starting with checkboxes, probably the most common type of question used in ATE evaluation surveys. Let's say respondents select from a list the snack they most frequently have. Your most basic tools will be those that show you the frequency distribution. You're looking at the numbers or percentages of respondents that picked each option. So a frequency table, such as you see at the top, um, or a bar chart or column chart, such as we see down here, these are ways of clearly showing your overall results. Often, though, you're going to want to go further than just seeing how many of each response you got. You'll want to know if different subgroups within your population gave different responses. But this cross-tabulation is a great tool. Um, a cross-tabulation is like a frequency table, except that it separates the responses of the various subgroups in your population. Maybe you want to look at differences in responses among age groups you'd arrange your table like this with the groups down the rows and the choices in the columns. From looking at this, you can start to see some differences, such as the spike in attraction to donuts in the 25 to 34 age group. Uh, you can see donuts falling off in favor as age increases, and except for donuts, of course. It often helps to represent the data visually in order to see patterns more clearly. You can do a clustered column chart, such as this one, which shows even more strongly the tendency toward evening out in higher age groups and a strong showing in pizza consumption in 25 to 34 year olds. Now, if you're more interested in percentage distribution than raw numbers, you can do a stacked column chart, which shows one bar for each age group and distributes the colors within the bar according to the distribution of preferences within the group. The tools in the process are not that different, are pretty similar for other kinds of survey data, such as rankings. And that's another type of, another common type of survey question. Suppose you have a question that asks respondents to rank a number of points. Now, these can be a bit tricky. There is sometimes a tendency to want to take the average of the rankings for each option. But these are categorical data, not continuous, so you can't use those basic quantitative tools. This may seem counterintuitive. If you're ranking one thing first and another second, aren't rankings inherently numbers? They are expressed in numbers, but they are not at consistent intervals. The difference between one respondent's first place and second place may be vast, and another is almost non-existent. So what do you do? There's a system called the Borda count, which is referenced in your handout, so um, don't worry about taking down the formula or anything now. But basically, it, it makes it very simple. It allocates a certain number of points to each option for each ranking that it receives, and in tallying them all up, produces an overall ranking. So for first place, you'd give it three points, for second place, two, third point, one, and fourth, zero. So for example, for, for this type of for this example, um, the calculations would look like this. 
you would tally up all the first, second, third, and fourth rankings that each one received and give it 3, 2, 1, or 0 points for each one, tally them all up, and you come up with a total number of basically preference points that each one received. Cookies 524, donut 664, pizza a whopping 1,330, and ice cream 482. So we see that pizza is the clear winner. Now that you have this result, you can do the same with it that you would do with checkbox question data. You use different visuals to represent it, break it up into age groups, or just play with it any way you want. Here you just see a simple column chart showing the overall ranking that the board account produced. And you would get more interesting looking visuals um, if you broke it down into subgroups. And we'll look at that more in a minute. Because now I want to go over uh, the last type of common survey question, which is, as I mentioned before, the Likert scale. This is one of the most common types of questions you see on ATE evaluation survey instruments or on most survey instruments. And like rankings, it can be very tricky because it too sometimes masquerades and sometimes even successfully as continuous data. In fact, there are some analysts who would contend that when there are seven or more options on your Likert scale, you can treat it as continuous data. But this is very hotly contested in the quantitative analysis community. And anyway, who uses a seven point plus Likert scale? That seems way too complicated for me. Nevertheless, you do often see Likert data treated this way. They'll be presented by mean and mode or plotted to show distribution as though they're continuous data. And you really can't do this for the same reason you can't do it with any categorical data. The intervals between the values are not consistent and are, in fact, unknown. Is the difference between strongly disagree and somewhat disagree equal to the difference between somewhat disagree and neutral? It depends entirely on the respondent. Uh, the numbers attached to these options are not really numbers. They're only guides to the respondent in understanding the options. So you can analyze them in the same ways we saw with the other types of categorical data, a frequency table, such as you see at the top, or a column chart showing the frequency with which each choice was selected. Now these examples are just showing the simple numbers of each response, which is only the first way that you look at the data, where you really start to see interesting pieces of information that can lead you to findings is when you start to break down the data and compare what you're seeing from different types of respondents. We saw this a bit earlier with the differences in age group in the crosstab table in the responses to the snack questions. And you can see similar patterns here. For example, more evidence of the overall evening out of preference in the oldest group surveyed whose responses are clustered in the somewhat and neutral. And you can see this more clearly with a clustered column chart. Now, it may not be the case that disaggregating suddenly shows you something earth shattering that reveals your entire story but it will give you new pieces of information to combine with other pieces of information that you get in the same way. And these will add up to your findings. Here's another visual take on these data, this time looking at responses by percentage within each group. As you can see, this visual highlights even more the differences among the groups, especially that finding that both strong agreement and strong disagreement seem to wane in the oldest group. Now, I want to finish, um, though, with a caution about the uses of visual representations after I just showed you one after the other, uh, but specifically how you use them in presenting your findings. I am all for the profligate use of visual representations while you're trying to make the data make sense to you. You can show it to yourself this way, that way, transpose the columns and rows and see what it looks like then, use different types of charts and tables, and give yourself questions to ask the rest of your data whether from this same data set or from other types of data within your study. For example, I might look at this and say perhaps extreme ends, uh, responses at both ends decrease with age because of an overall more balanced approach to diet and nutrition. But this is a query for me to follow up on in the rest of my analysis. Visual representations of survey responses should only be included in presentations of findings when they in themselves demonstrate not just one piece of information, but a finding. And when used that way, they can be an extremely effective way to communicate the power and depth of descriptive.